Welcome to Sunday morning services. I'm glad that you're able to join us. What we're going to be doing is to try to do these services as normal as possible with selections of new pre-recorded songs as well as archive songs from the past year. If any of you would like to set a time to record a song for services, please let me know. I am going to be asking Debbie Taylor to see if she can continue doing our bulletins as usual so we can keep up to date with what's going on within the church, prayer requests, and the like. I do have one announcement this morning. Ms. Terry Wright has asked us to send our tithes and offerings directly to her house during this time. Her address is 175 Dickinson Avenue, Beckley, West Virginia, 25801. Again, 175 Dickinson Avenue, Beckley, West Virginia, 25801. In regards to other announcements, this Sunday was our Brian Safe House offering, so I'd ask that, that you'd follow as the Lord would lead and send those, those offerings to Miss Terry. Next Sunday will be our Faith Promise offering, so remember that offering as well and do as the Lord would have you to. We do want to get things started off on the right foot this morning, and that would be a prayer. So would you join me, please? Dear Lord and Holy Father, we thank you for this day once again. We thank you for the many blessings bestowed upon us. We thank you for the wonderful weather you've been blessing us with, dear Lord, and just pray that you'd be with each one of us as we're going about our day-to-day -day lives during this time of crisis, dear Lord. We just pray that in each action that we do, it would be to exemplify you, to where people can see their need for you through our lives. We ask you to be with the services as they go forth um, this morning, dear Lord. We just pray that the selection of songs and the message that Brother Marty gives will just be able to touch people's souls and encourage them. And if there happen to be one out here that doesn't know you as their Savior, that they might come to know you before it's everlasting too late. We ask that you continue to be with our church as we're going through this uh, COVID process, dear Lord, and, and secluding one another. We just pray you just encourage the members, dear Lord. Help them to rely on you. Help them to draw courage and strength from you during this difficult time. We ask you to be with our church as we're continuing to look for our pastor, and we thank you for Brother Marty and for his willingness to be put for a vote once we can get our, our members back together. We just pray you continue to be with him and bless him and encourage him and his family as well. We ask you to lead, guide, and direct throughout the remainder of this service for us in the blessed and holy name. Amen. Well, to start things off this morning, we are going to be going for a selection from our youth bell choir. I hope you enjoy. up, we're going to have two songs from our youth choir. I know you'll enjoy them. They're always favorites.
does If you had seen the look of pain on his face If you had heard the awful sounds of the nails that pierced his flesh Then you could know why we sing Amazing Grace service we're going to have two of my favorites from the adult choir please sing along if you know them Day after day 
time to get down to the seriousness. I hope you've enjoyed the service thus far. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Marty for him to deliver the message from God's Word. Thank you, and God bless. Greetings. It's good to be back with you today, and I pray that we have a good fellowship around God's Word. I want to say thank you to uh, Brother Edwin for taking the time and sacrifice and using his knowledge to put this together so we can have the video recordings and for all of us. And I'd ask you to make sure you thank him as well. There's a lot of time involved in this. Um, I'm glad to, to be able to open God's Word and share it with you. I must say that it makes me feel a little insecure because I can't tell if you're sleeping. I don't hear any amens and things of that sort. And so, but we pray that the Lord will give us a good service um, tonight, this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, Ecclesiastes 1, and we're going to read a few verses here and get into a Bible study. So I invite you to open your Bible up, and we're going to read some verses, have prayer, and then get into our study. Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, and it reads in verse number 1, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to the place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and toward about uh, unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea. Yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath already of old time, been of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of the former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of the things that are to come with those that shall come after. Let's have prayer. Father, we are grateful that we have your words and we thank you in this an interesting time that we live. And, and for most of us, this is uh, a time that we we've, have no liken to. It's, it's not anything to compare. But we uh, rejoice in the fact, Lord, that you are the same and your words, Lord, are the same and that our future is the same. And Lord, those constants in our life, we rejoice about that. And we pray that as we uh, have service this morning and look to your words, we pray that your Spirit would be actively working in my heart and in the hearts of all those who listen. May, Lord, your Spirit be just as real, your presence be just as real as if we were actually here inside the, the build, church building itself and having services. May, Lord, you fill us and draw us closer together unto you and unified together as a family. We uh, pray, Lord, you help us to glean from the Scriptures. And understand, Lord, some of the truth, some of the application that is that uh, is uh, in regards to us and how that God it can be of help to us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have. We thank you for being such a great and a wonderful God. We love you so very much and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we read over these first verses here in Ecclesiastes, we read verses 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through verse number 11. And in reality, this whole chapter or this whole book of Ecclesiastes really can be summed up in verse 13. And I advise you to look at this. Solomon writes this, And I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of men to be the exercise therewith. And we see here that Solomon confesses that he he had devoted his life. He devoted his life. Here he states to search out wisdom. Solomon had questions. There were questions. There were things that he wanted to figure out. And I don't know all the questions that he had. I, had. I think that Ecclesiastes reveals some of those main questions that he had. And I think those questions are not much different than the questions that men have today. Questions such 
such as, what is the meaning of life? Or questions such as, what is the existence? What is the existence all about? Or maybe a question such as this that I believe Solomon was asking, is life worth living for? Or maybe better said, what is worth living for? And Solomon here, he asked these questions thousands of years ago when this book was written. He in turn makes his report. He in turn goes on his investigative tour and he makes his report and he writes this book to testify about the answer of the questions that he was searching out for. And it's interesting because even still to this day, we find those questions are still prevalent. We find that those questions are still being asked by young people. And many young people would believe and think that there may be perhaps some of the first that have thought about these questions that Solomon had as well. There are others in turn who go through trauma in their life and they have these questions that come about. There are people that they in turn cross paths with someone who's drastically different than they are and it generates questions that sends them on a journey but in reality they're nothing more than the same questions that Solomon, the wisdom that Solomon was seeking out, the, the, the questions that Solomon was searching to find the right answers for. And once Solomon makes his report, as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, what you'll find is that his report that he has given to us is really a depressing report. It's highly negative, and though, though it is negative, it's not pessimistic, it's realistic. It in turn is helping us understand what is real. You see that he, by negative teaching, is teaching us, revealing to us really what is a profound, a profound truth. And what Solomon is telling us this, he said, if you really want to understand life, he said, then subtract God away from life, and then look at life separate from God. He said, then after you do this, he said, then bring God back into the picture, and it's then that you can really understand what life is all about. Now we understand that Solomon, though I believe Solomon in the writing of Ecclesiastes was a repentive man, but Solomon is writing about those years that he in turn was away from God, those times when he in, he in turn was serving and searching and seeking and involved in those practices that were not necessarily honoring to God, and Solomon now pins this down as his testimony, his, his memoir, his, his report, I want you to understand here is the answer to the questions that I was seeking out. And as I read over this chapter here and even the whole book, there are some questions or some statements that I find that are very prevalent that stick off of the pages of God's Word. We look here in verse number 3 of chapter number 1. Notice, if you will, uh, What profit hath the man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and, and turneth about into the north, it whirl about it continually, and the wind returneth again according to its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it, and the eye, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. And as I read over these verses here, one of the things that we see that Solomon is reporting to us about, he's helping us to understand really how effective man is in this world. He's helping us to understand how much change we really can bring. He's helping us to understand man's failure, their, their inability to impact this world. Solomon here is helping us to see that this world, it has been, it will continue. This world has longevity, but man in turn comes and goes. He in turn it helps us to understand that the sun rises and then it sets and the wind blows and goes in its circuits and it returns back and the rivers they flow and for the most part they're still going in the same direction and for the most part they're still emptying and you know, going through the same valleys and they all empty back into the same places. And all of man, all of man's involvement that has been for all of these thousands of years has failed. It's it failed in result of man changing this world. Man doesn't change this world. And some of the greatest mistruths that we have are prevalent today is this idea that man can change. We can change the environment. That man can change the world. That in turn there's some way man and society is going to change. My friend, this world is not going to change unless God is the one that changes it. And there have been times that He has. There's times that He's caused the sun to stand still. But man will go about and man will build his uh, bridges and, and man will build his roads and man will build his dams and he'll do things such as this. But my friend, they don't last. They don't stand. All of the effort that, 
that will go into building something like the Hoover Dam or, or all the effort that will go into building a, a, some bridge or all the effort that goes into building uh, something like Solomon's Temple. And all of this work and effort and money and so forth. Well, where is Solomon's Temple today? And bridges of the past in turn are no more. And the bridges we have today, they will go away as well. And in turn, dams that have been made, they will one day falter and fail and they will be no more because we don't change nature. We don't change this world. And Solomon is, is expressing this. I went on a journey and I built cities and I built buildings and I, I built a temple and, and I built this and built that and I built all these things. But I come to understand the reality that man really doesn't change the world. This world continues. And it... Um, it leaves me with really, you know, it leaves me with, with, with no bearing, no place. Uh, where, where, how do I fit in all of this? My grandchildren, uh, which presently I do not have, but when I do have, if God blesses me with grandchildren, and then my great-grandchildren, and then my great-grandchildren, and my mother and father, and my grandparents, and my great-grandparents, they all watch the sun rise, and they watch the sun set. You read in Psalm chapter 19 and verse number 6, the scripture reveals it has a circuit that it goes on and that hasn't changed. And we've done all of these things. The gases and, and you know the carbon footprint and, and all of this, this scare tactic teaching that has infiltrated our children as though we're going to change nature and change the world and change the environment. My friend, we're not going to change anything. This world in turn man has, man has, has always and will continue to be unsuccessful in its ability to change or to impact this world. A thousand years from now, if God, if God allows that time uh, to pass, the winds will blow as they blow today, and the storms will come as they come today, and the rain will fall as it falls today, and the sun will rise and set as it rises and sets today, and you'll find that there really won't be much different. And in turn, structures that are existing today, most of which, if not all of which, in turn, they will go away. And Solomon, again, to emphasize, Solomon had given his life to run a government, to develop a land, to, to construct buildings, to make cities, and, and to make a temple. And, and he succeeded in making all of these changes in his culture. But he stepped back and he was stepping back and looking and he said, you know, all of this that I'm doing, when I stop breathing, just in a little bit of time, nature will take over. Life will take over. The world will take over everything that, I, that I, we have done. We find that we have no real ability to change this world, to change, to make an impact upon this world. We're not going to hold the sun. We're not really going to stop rivers from flowing in the direction. We're not going to keep them from going into the sea. And all the processes that God had put in place at creation, they still exist today and they will continue to exist. And man is not going to change that. I think what pricked me to study this chapter was uh, just uh, uh, news, the news about the coronavirus and all the changes that have been taking place uh, in our society as we have tried to accommodate and, and prevent, do, do those things which are preventative so that we can stop the spread of this virus. And I have said and, and, and I have heard many say, boy, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen anything at this degree or this level. I don't ever remember. I was talking to my grandmother. She's 94 years old and she was telling me, I don't ever remember in my lifetime anything that's quite like this before. And, and it gives you the idea or the mindset that this is something that is new. That this is something that never has occurred before. That this is something that, that has, that, you know, that, that has come upon us and, and, is, and, and in turn is changing the world. And yet, um, as I began to watch some videos and do some reading and search and uh, through the internet was looking about past historical events I found that this is not the first time that something like this has happened in fact I find that there are there are innumerable cases of things such as this that, that have happened I was shocked to learn to find to get a history lesson history lesson of the the Spanish flu that took place in 1918 uh, up until 1920 uh, 1919, I mean, 1919, December 1919. In that period of time, in America alone, we lost 675,000 people for the Spanish flu. 
worldwide, they said a conservative estimate was around 50 million people. Some even said it was upwards to 100 million people. At 50 million people, it was literally one third of the population of the world that passed away in that time. And during that time, they, they shut down, uh, you know, the governments and the transportation and system and, and, and all the public facilities they shut down. And even churches, in turn, they were required to shut down by the government. And, and as I was studying that, I realized there was a lot of similarities of things that have happened then as opposed to things that are happening now. And again, it just, it has reminded me, it's reminded me once again that, that, that in turn, this story that we see here in Ecclesiastes chapter number one, that man really doesn't change nature. Man really doesn't impact much about nature. But not only is man doesn't really change much in this world, he doesn't really impact much in this world. We see also about this in verse number 9 and 10, the thing that hath been is a thing that shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time which was before us. Not only do we see that, that man really doesn't, you know, impact, you know, doesn't really change the world, and we're not going to change the world, that we can change people, but not the world. But the second thing we see that Solomon here is giving to us in his report is that life is really, it's cyclical. I mean, life is just a matter of endless cycles, endless repetitions, that there's really nothing really new that takes place. And, and as we go through this, this chapter here, verse number one, he says, one generation passed away. There's a generation that is born and grows, another day pass away, another generation comes. He talks about the cycle of the sun, it rises and it sets. He's then, verse number six, he talks about the cycle of the wind. He talks about the cycle in verse number seven of the rivers. He talks about the cycle of labor. And verse number eight, you see he's mentioning all these, all of these different things and he's helping us to understand there's really no sensationalism about this world. You know, we love, we love the, the, you know, the concept of, you know, what's in outer space and what's on the planet of Mars or are there, you know, aliens that live someplace, you know, and we love the idea of something being new or something being different and, and something changing and the fact that we perhaps can be a part of that change and Solomon in turn set out in his lifetime to break that cyclical life. He said, I, I in turn have given given myself to not live by repetition, but he said, I've come to understand that life is nothing more than repetition. It's the same old, same old. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, that's just what it is. You're born, you live, you die. You're born, you live, you die. The sun rises and then it goes down. The wind blows and then it returns back. The rivers go to the oceans and then they're evaporated, they're rained upon, they go back down the rivers. He said, everything in this world is nothing more than a sun. And he said, this in turn, this endless cycle only tells me that there is nothing new. Nothing new. Now think about this. How our society is permeated with marketing and with influence from other sources that try to gender up excitement from people about the idea that this is new and this is exciting and this is the first time. And, then, and here Solomon saying there's really nothing that is new. As one man said, he said, the ancients in turn discovered all. The ancients in turn, they were the ones that did all. He said, we discover nothing at all. When you look back at history and you see structures that have been built like the pyramids, you know, the ancient, uh, the, of ancient, uh, the Egyptian culture, and you study that and look at these rocks that were, they were hundreds, hundreds of tons, and they in turn were able to move them, and they didn't have the equipment that we have today. And yet today we think, we have that which in turn man has never had. We have something that is new. We're doing things that never have been done. We're experiencing diseases, viruses that have never been upon culture before. And here Solomon is saying, I've, I've just learned that everything's a cycle. And this is part of why society is so restless, because one, we don't like cycles, repetition, and two, we really like for things to change. We like to change what we have, change what we, where we go, change what we eat, and that's not the case with all people. Certainly there are exceptions to that, but by and large, human, e human nature, they enjoy the idea of change. 
And Solomon here is, is expressing this in his report. He said, I've come to learn. He says, not only that man really doesn't change anything, man really doesn't impact the world. He said, but I've come to understand that, that everything in this world is really cyclical. He said, it's just repetitious. It just, it just like a cycle in a circle. You know, one man said, he said, this uh, life is really just a, a weary, a weary merry-go-round. A weary merry-go-round. Now again, Solomon is not speaking from the perspective of God being in a person's life. The center of life. He's speak, speaking from the perspective of a person being separated and living a life that is man-centered. And he says, as I, as I look at that, he said, there's, it's just a cycle. We don't change anything, really. Uh, and this idea that we're changing, you know, we're, we're changing the climate. There perhaps are some people that dream about doing that. But man doesn't change anything. And he said, secondly, he said, everything's really just a cycle. It just, you're born, you live, and you die. And, and that's the case of all people. And the sun rises, and it sets. And the wind blows and swirls and returns. And a river flows right back to the place to where it came from. And man labors only to get up the next day to labor again. To get up the next day to labor again. He said all things are really the same. They're just cyclical. There's nothing that is new at all. Our former president, Harry Truman, he said, there's nothing new in the world except the history that you and I do not know. There's nothing new in the world except for the history that you and I do not know. I like what this gentleman said. His name is George Santillana. He said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And yet, <clears throat> you know, we would say, well, we're the baby boomer generation. Uh, we're Generation X. We're Generation Y. We're Generation Z, etc. And the way we present that, it's not just presenting perhaps, you know, how this generation came about or problems that this generation may be facing. But it's the idea that there's something uniquely different about that generation that hasn't been about other generations. As though perhaps they're not going to be born and live and die. As perhaps though the sun is not going to rise and set, the wind's not going to blow, swirl and return, and the river's not going to flow and then return back and flow again. As though they don't have to labor and go to bed and get up and labor again. As though there's something uniquely different. And you understand that Generation Y, X, Booby Boomers, it matters not. There may be differences in character of people because of how they matured. Yes, that's, that's definitely true. That has come about because of circumstances of family or maybe, maybe circumstances that have happened worldwide or, or, or within a particular generation or a particular nation. That may be true. But my friend, every generation in turn, there is really nothing different. It's just a cycle. And this is what Solomon is uh, teaching or giving to us in his report. Generations come and go, but the earth, it stands forever. It doesn't go anywhere at all. And uh, we're going to die, and the earth will still be here until God decides to come and to uh, destroy it and rebake it, rebuild it, and make it what He desires it to be, to remake it. But until that time, it's just going to be a cycle. And I go back again to <clears throat> what I had mentioned a moment ago in concerns to this coronavirus has taken place. It's serious and, and it's affecting a lot of people's lives and there have been people that have, that many people that have lost, they've lost dear ones, people that were dear and precious to them. And we grieve about that. But we don't make light of that at all. But, but what we see in scriptures is that there's nothing new under the sun. What has been is what is. And what has happened today, what's happened today is things that have happened in the past. And this was so enlightening to me as I look back over history. And I realized what I wasn't even conscious of. Maybe I have read it in the past. Maybe I at one point uh, understood it. But I certainly had not thoroughly read about these different pandemics or natural disasters that had taken place. 
And as I read about these events in the past, I said, Father, these, these things have happened in the past. And, and as we mentioned about the Spanish flu, far worse than what we're facing today. There's nothing new under the sun. Life is just a cycle. We don't really change anything. We don't change this world, and, and we're not responsible for the changes that are taking place in this world, as, as in turn some politicians, protesters, left-wing activists would like to say. God is the one that will change this world whenever He so fit. And then secondly, we see that life is really just a cycle. It's a lot of repetition. And all of us like to climb to the heap of it and, and have the joy and the pride of knowing that, uh, that we broke the cycle. But, but the truth is, is that at best we can repair and remodel and rebuild, etc. We can do things such as that, but we really don't, we really don't ever change the cycle, uh, the cycle of this life. Then I was thinking of uh, these last verses here, which is, is probably the more discouraging part of what he writes, or depressing part. In verse number 11, if you look with me at chapter 1, he says, There is no remembrance of the former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are come with those that shall come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This was sore travail, hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. So we see that Solomon, in the giving of his report, which is really the theme that goes through the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, I've just come to understand that, that man doesn't really change this world. He doesn't impact. Again, we can change people. Well, we can touch people's lives and, and touch them for, God's, uh, for God and, and bring them to a point that they understand their need for Christ. We can help and counsel. Yes, we can touch people's lives. But we don't change this world. We don't change nature. Second thing he said was that this world is cyclical. It's just cycles. It's a lot of repetitions. You're born and you die. The sun rises and it sets. We see the river, it flows and it returns. And the wind blows and swirls and then it comes back to the place from where it came from. A man labors, goes to bed, gets up the next day, and then he goes to labor. But in verse number 11, you see that he mentions the last thing. He talks about <coughs> this idea of remembering. A and he says here that <coughs> nobody really remembers. No nobody really remembers what happened in the past. It's almost as though that we, we walk through life or that history is, we go through life and history really is like footprints in the sand. They can be seen, but, but over time the wind blows to the point that it covers up those footprints. And how much history has been lost. And, and, and how much history isn't known. And honestly, even in our country today, that, that we're repeating, we're repeating. We have stages in our country today of, of matters within our, within our politics that are taking place that are nothing more than a repetition of what has happened in history. And, and if we knew history, then we would understand the results, what would be the outcome of these things that are taking place. But yet, um, we, we don't know history. Um, sadly, our, many of our young people, they, they not only have a home that isn't stable, they don't have the enjoyment of having healthy relationships in a home. They, they don't have perhaps a home that, that a mother and father or one or the other know Christ. And, and they take, the, they take uh, accountability for that child and their spirituality and bring them to church where they can learn about Christ. But many of our young people, they, they don't even know history. They don't even know history of our nation. Many of our Christians, we don't know history of of uh, Christianity. We, we have little understanding about how we came to the point of where we are, how we received our Bible. We know about Christ. Maybe we know some doctrine. Maybe we know some, some particular dates in history, but there's a lot that we don't know about the past. And Solomon here, he, he's writing this, and he says, I, it's come to understand 
that everything that's happening today will one day be forgotten. One day it will not be remembered. All the people that have lived in the past, all the things, the events that have taken place, these phenomenas that have happened, diseases, pandemics, and wars, and so forth, the longer we go, the less they're remembered. And there's so much of history that has been completely forgotten. There is no evidence that we can grasp, some, something that we can grasp to know what the history may be. And so Solomon talks about this. And, and I, as I read over that, again, Solomon is writing for, from a humanistic standpoint. As a man that, that walked away from God, and he sought wisdom. He was trying to find answers to questions. And he now writes his report. He's now come back to God. He's repented. He's come back to God. And he writes his report out to us today. And we read this. And, and he makes a few, a few statements here in chapter 1 saying, number one, he said, it's... He said, I realize that I don't, I can build my castles and kingdoms and cities and my walls and my, my bridges and I can do all of these things, you know, but I really come to understand we don't impact this world. We don't change this world. We don't change nature. Nature in turn, we may alter it slightly. We may, we may somehow, you know, somehow restrict it for a short period of time. But eventually, everything goes back to exactly as it was before, or very close to it. The second thing he says here, as we read, that life is just a lot of repetition. A lot of repetition. He says, just getting up, <clears throat> going to work, coming home, going to bed. Getting up, going to work, going home, going to bed. You're born, you live, you die. The sun rises, and then it sets. The rivers flow, and then they return. The wind blows, and it swirls, and it comes back. He says, just a lot of repetition. And uh, there's just nothing new. Everything is the same. Thomas Edison said, he said, I, I don't create anything. He said, my inventions are not a creation. He said that all I'm doing is taking those secret things of nature and, and revealing them so they can become a part of our life. He said, but as an inventor, I don't create anything. And Edison understood that there's nothing new and that life is just cycles. But somehow he figured out how to, how to use some of those cycles for their own benefit. And then lastly he said here that the consequences of all this, you'll not be remembered. I, I don't know who my great, great grandfather is. I don't even know my great, great grandfather's name. Part of that is because of family, things within my family, but I don't know. Certainly don't know anybody beyond that. I, I knew my grandfather and um, my grandmother know, knew my grandparents, knew them, knew them well. But I got to thinking about this one day. I said, you know, my, my children, they don't know my grandfather. My grandfather was just little. Or my, my children were little when my grandfather passed away. My, uh, on my father's side, my, on my mother's side, my grandfather passed away before I was even married. And all they know is what I tell them. And, and I'm not so sure that they, they'll be able to tell my children very much about my grandparents. The point is, is that it'll be forgotten. And so when you read all of this, you don't really change anything. Life is just a cycle. And the consequences are that you just are forgotten. And everything else is forgotten. And so one could become very cynical and say, what is life really about? Why, what's the purpose of even living? I invite you, if you will, turn to a chapter number 12, and we'll just go right to the end of the chapter. And again, I emphasize, Solomon is writing... He writes Ecclesiastes from a humanistic standpoint, or much of it is written that way. He said, if you, you want to understand what life is about, then start off by taking God out of life and look at the futility. Look at the futility of life. 
apart from God. And he says, then, then you'll understand that life really doesn't have any meaning. You can't change anything. It's just a bunch of cycles, and the consequences are that you're, going, you're just going to be forgotten, and everything else forgotten. And that's why humanism always leads to this, just do what feels good for you today. Because the ultimate result of humanism is this. You know, what really matters is that I'm happy and that I enjoy my moment and that I have joy and happiness and experience. That's what matters. Because what is life? Life is, life is vain. You know what Solomon said? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. But in chapter number 12, as he finishes his report, he pins these words down in verse number 13 in verse number 14 and says let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil and Solomon finishes and says this he said from a humanistic standpoint life really has no value it's just vain he said, but life isn't to be lived from a humanistic standpoint. The lack of change in the cycles and the consequences, those things in turn, that they have meaning if God is the center of your life. Because with God the center of my life, I can make change. Maybe not to nature. Maybe not to the climate or the environment. Maybe not anything lasting with structures and buildings and cities and governments and things of that sort, but I can make change. Eternal, everlasting change in the lives that I touch with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the people that I encourage and influence and help to, uh, to train them, teach them, counsel them in the precepts of God's Word. I can make a lasting change in their life. And, and yes, life is... A full of cycles and, and repetitions. But my friend, cycles and repetitions are only discontenting to the person who hasn't found their contentment in God. And they have to find another mountain, you know, another sensational event for life to be somewhat worth living. But in turn, when a person has God and they're drawing from you know, the brook of God's Word, and they have the indwelling of His Spirit, and they see the purpose of life, then cycles in turn are a blessing. They're not a curse. And as far as consequences, yes, it's true. You know, who is, who is Marty? M Marty Stoniker? You know, my name will be forgotten. It'll be remembered by my children. It'll be remembered by people that, that I, that we were, we shared our lives together. But very quickly, my name will be forgotten. Who I was and things that I did will be forgotten and forgotten forever. But nothing about me will ever be forgotten with God. He remembers everything about me. And that's why life in turn, what I do today and how I live today is so important. Because one day we see here in uh, uh, Exodus 12, I will stand before him in judgment and I will have to answer before my God. Amen. As I was meditating on this, my mind went to uh, the story, or not story, but the passage in John chapter 4. Uh, John chapter 4, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John, and New Testament, John chapter 4. And this is the testimony of, testimony of Christ in John chapter 4 and verse number 34. And uh, I'd like for you to look at that with me, please. Verse number 34, Jesus said this unto them, My meat, my sustenance, my purpose, you know, where I get my joy, my energy, you know, what, where I get my fuel for living, my meat, is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. John the Baptist said something similar, or I'm going to say John the Baptist, but Paul said something similar in Philippians 1 and verse number 21. If you look there with me, Philippians 1 and verse number 21. One twenty-one, he says this. 
For me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, <clears throat> this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. And here we see an example of Christ, an example of Paul, of men who found fulfillment and contentment. They found purpose. They found understanding of what life is all about. And he said, life is about doing the will of God. Jesus said, that's my meat. And here we see Paul said that that's my life, is to live for Christ. And so I encourage us as a church uh, this morning, for this morning's service, that, that we need to be mindful, mindful of this. That if we're going through this, 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 depressing, this depressing nature as Solomon reveals to us, what should I do and how should I live? And, and you know, I can't really change anything. And, and, and the coronavirus... My friend, there's nothing new. Life is just cycles. You're really not going to change anything in this world in nature. And it'll all be forgotten. And all that is true. But our purpose isn't found in anything other than the fulfilling of the will of God in our lives. Do you know His will? Are you fulfilling His will? Do you have Christ? And are you living for Christ? And that's what Solomon was saying. He went on this sidetrack. He left the will of God as a king. And he began to search out wisdom and, and to find answers to questions. And, and this ended up in decades as he was away from God. And then he comes back and says, I did all of that. And he said, what I learned from it was that life is about doing God's will. Fear Him. And keep His commandments, because one day you have a judgment. And so I encourage all of us right now, that though everything's disrupted and things are changed and so forth and so on, all of this, there's nothing new. And uh, these are the cycles of life. And these things will be forgotten as well. But our happiness and contentment is found only in this, that we in turn have found God's will and we live in God's will. Father, we are grateful for your words, and we thank you for this uh, candid testimony from Solomon. We thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to see this picture that Solomon was able to record for us and to write down for us this, this story of his own life and to encapsulate it in these few verses, these few chapters for us. We pray we'll take it to heart. Lord, I pray you'll help us to find it. It really doesn't matter where we are, where we go, what we have, what we drive, what we wear, etc. The houses and all. I mean, life is, those things really are not what brings us contentment and happiness. And we know that in our mind, but it's so hard to practice. Lord, help us to grasp that, that life is and should be, our meat should be to do the will of God. And that we, we want to be as Paul, that we live that to, for Christ, that we live because of Christ and, and we die because of Christ. Lord, help us, help that to be our, our, our focus. Help us, Lord, to make that our life. Please watch over the church family. Pray you put hedges about all of them, especially those ones, Lord, who have compromised health. And we pray, Lord, that through this time that we will stay faithful to you and and that our thoughts, our prayer, our Bible reading, our relationships, Lord, will be good and will not uh, compromise in our Christianity in these times. And we ask, Lord, that you will use all these events for the furthering of your will and uh, bringing people to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.